welcome to another joint virtual event sponsored by the Norman Studio Silent Film Museum in Jacksonville, Florida, and the Niles SNA Silent Film Museum in Fremont, California. In this edition of Early Filmmaking in Jacksonville, Florida, we'll be examining the life and career of producer Richard Norman. Hi, I'm Jim Kirkhoff with Norman Studios. Joining me will be one of my colleagues, Barbara Wingo, along with Richard Norman's biographer, Barbara Tepalupak. We have a lot to cover in the program, so let me turn things over to Barbara Wingo. I am Barbara Wingo, Vice President and Curator of Norman Studios Silent Film Museum Incorporated in Jacksonville, Florida. You will be hearing from me later on in this presentation discussing more about this very unique property, which consists of a complete five building silent films complex in the Jacksonville suburb of Arlington. This is in fact a property that Richard Norman utilized in his filming of race films, as will be explained to you by our speaker, Barbara Tepalupak. Let me also point out that we have a special part of this presentation, which is Sleepy Sam the Sleuth, which was Richard Norman's initial foray into filmmaking. And thanks to the Library of Congress, as well as of course the donation by the Norman family, we're able to show this for the very first time on this presentation. Now let me introduce our wonderful speaker, Barbara Tepalupak. Barbara Tepalupak has a, such a long vita that it would take the entire presentation should I discuss it all, so I will be brief. Uh, she is a former professor of English at St. John's University and Wayne State College. She is a Fulbright professor, or she was a Fulbright professor of American literature in Poland and in France. She was an academic dean at SUNY and New York State Public Scholar as well. She has written extensively on American literature, film, and popular culture. She is the editor of Early Race Filmmaking in America, as well as a three book series on adapting literature to film. She is also the author of Silent Serial Sensations, The Wharton Brothers and the Magic of Early Cinema, Literary Ad Adaptations in Black American Cinema, From Michaud to Morrison, and of course, and the reason that she is here, the author of Richard E. Norman and Race Filmmaking. Her latest book, which will be released in the fall of this year, is The Othering of Women in Silent Film, Cultural, mm -hmm. Historical, and Literary Contexts. So we very much welcome Barbara Tepalupet to this presentation. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of this ongoing dialogue between the Niles SNA Museum and the Norman Studio Silent Film Museum. I'm delighted to have the chance to speak about Richard E. Norman, a native Floridian and a pioneer, but an underappreciated figure in early cinema. A Southern born white man, Norman became one of the most successful and prolific race filmmakers of his day. A savvy marketer, he capitalized on the popular fascination with exotic locales and new technologies like automobiles and airplanes, which he incorporated into his films. A zealous self-promoter, Norman developed clever and elaborate exploitation accessories and ballyhoos to attract moviegoers to his feature films. A fierce independent, he refused to amalgamate with other filmmakers or to seek backing from outside investors in his company. Instead, he self-financed his films, occasionally attempting alternative financing, such as a profit-sharing franchise. A businessman and true entrepreneur, he was the only race filmmaker to own and operate his own production studio, which was located in Jacksonville, Florida. And even after most of his fellow race film producers were forced out of the business by high production costs, poor distribution outlets, and the transition from silent to sound films, he found innovative ways to maintain his ties to the film industry. 
Yet, despite the fact that he was a worthy rival to his far better known contemporaries, Oscar Michel, whom you can see on the left in this image, and George and Noble Johnson on the right, his contribution to race filmmaking has only lately been recognized. Like so much of early race filmmaking history, Norman's story cannot be told fully or even largely through his feature films, only one of which survives in its entirety. Rather, his story must be carefully reconstructed through film fragments, personal and professional correspondence, business records, censorship certificates, movie flyers, contemporary film reviews and scripts. That process of reconstruction offers film scholars and film enthusiasts an essential model for researching the works of other early independent film producers in the absence of the films themselves, a process that film historian Ali Field so aptly described as researching an archive of absence. Born in Middleburg, Florida in 1891, Norman attended Massey Business College. At an early age, he displayed his entrepreneurial talents especially with a drink that he created with the help of his pharmacist father. The drink was called Pasicola, and it was intended to rival Coca-Cola, but unfortunately never did. After his parents separated in 1910, Richard and his two brothers, Bruce and Earl, moved with their mother to Kansas City, Kansas. It was there in the Midwest around 1912 that Norman got his start in the film industry as a developer, a cameraman, and then an independent producer of industrial and historical shorts. Around 1915, as local talent moving pictures became popular nationwide, Norman moved into the home talent film production. That is, he began shooting short films that he scripted himself and that intercut images of local scenes and ordinary people with stock footage he purchased from other filmmakers of dramatic events like train wrecks and car chases. In that capacity, he started traveling around the Midwest, stopping in small towns to solicit business for those films. Shrewdly, he would always cast the town's most prominent or influential citizens, mayors, bank presidents, etc., and then he would use their film, uh, rather their, their homes, as his set. He would also invite other locals to appear in the group shots, which always included a big wedding party or some other gathering at the, the conclusion of the picture. Filming on site usually took no more than two or three days, after which Norman would carry the print to his laboratory in Des Moines develop it, and then return to the small towns to screen the finished picture. After the showings, he would usually sell the one real picture back to the town so they could keep re-showing it and seeing themselves in the movies. There were several different scripts that he wrote for that purpose. One was Sleepy Sam the Sleuth, in which Sam solves the foul mystery of the theft of Farmer Brown's chickens. The most popular script, however, was a railroad thriller and love story called The Wrecker. This particular program from one version of the record filmed in Marinette, Wisconsin, is of special interest because included in the wedding party scene was a young woman named Gloria Desjardins, who would soon become Norman's wife. Mrs. Norman later recalled that, that Richard had used one of the worst pickup lines in history. How would you like to be in the movies? I can make you a star. Clearly it worked, as they say in the movies, it got him the girl. In 1919, anxious to break into the burgeoning business of feature films, Norman relocated from the Midwest to his hometown of Jacksonville, Florida, which was then a center of modern filmmaking. Known as the winter film capital of the world, Jacksonville offered various advantages, good weather, uh, low production and labor costs, and established transportation routes to both the Northeast and the Midwest. Not only SNA, but also other major motion picture companies, including Calum, Motograph, Selig, Lubin, Thanhauser, and Vitagraph, had already moved there for seasonal or, in some cases, year round filming. In fact, by then, Richard's brother Bruce was working there as a cameraman for the Clutho studio. What most distinguished Norman from those other producers, however, was his decision to make race pictures, which featured all black casts, were created primarily for black audiences, and were typically shown in black or race theaters. Those race films created an all black world, and they spoke directly to and reflected in a non-stereotypic way the black experience. During his years as an independent traveling producer, Norman had observed the crowds of enthusiastic black film goers at midnight rambles and special colored showings. And he recognized the financial potential in producing and distributing pictures for such a broad but underrepresented market. There is no better angle of the motion picture business you can get into for quick returns and sure profit than Negro pictures, he wrote to a colleague. But profit was not Norman's only incentive. As his son, the late captain Richard Norman recalled, 
Foremost in his father's mind was the desire to improve race relations and to help black performers reach their full potential. Norman's first race feature film was The Green-Eyed Monster, a reworking of the popular white cast home talent melodrama, The Wrecker. In the film, rival railroad engineers Jim Hilton and, and Jack Manning vie for the hand of the superintendent's daughter, Helen Powers. Hilton's jealousy is stirred by Satan himself, who appears on some of the promotional materials and even makes an actual uh, cameo appearance in the film. So Hilton tries to sabotage the great mail race, which will decide the government fast rail contract. Despite Hilton's efforts to stop him, Manning wins the race and the contract and, of course, the love of Helen. The film ends with a shot of the, shot of the happy couple's wedding, intercut with images of Hilton peering out from behind the bars of his prison. The film's subplot featured another romance, the pursuit of bachelor Quintus Weefalls by two women, two mods, in fact, 425 pound Maud Johnson, who played the twice widowed Margarine Scrubs, and Maud Frisbee, who played the never married Cuspidor Lee. But Quintus, Quintus manages to escape their attentions and win the hand of yet another woman, the lovely actress Dazzle Zenor. The Green Eyed Monster capitalized on the contemporary audience interest in men, machines, and movement. And in the main plot, it depicted the post-war employment opportunities increasingly available to aspiring Blacks who had migrated north in new and emerging industries, such as railways and steel. Notably, Norman's characters were not low comic stereotypes, that is, the ubiquitous mammies, Uncle Toms, and Piccaninnies that dominated mainstream white film of that era. Rather, again, in the main plot, they were middle-class professionals in positions of authority and dignity, engineers, railroad superintendents. The film, shot in and around the Mayport, Florida train station, also emphasized the symbols of success that such opportunities afforded. Elegant homes, spacious offices, sophisticated attire of the principal characters. Black audiences, who were used to seeing Black characters typed by their tattered and exaggerated garb and restricted to roles as domestics and servants in mainstream white films, could and did take special pride in such anti-typing. The subplot of The Green-Eyed Monster, however, was considerably more formulaic and derivative. It depicted a wholly different class of Black characters, from scheming gamblers to razor-toting mammies, all of whom were engaged in a series of Keystone Cop-like adventures. Norman likely intended that comedy to complement and to comment on the main plot. At, at the most rudimentary level, it did. But whereas the courtship of Helen and Jack in the main plot is treated in a serious and realistic fashion, the pursuit of Quintus by the two women that you saw in the earlier still is portrayed as a succession of farcical misadventures and humorous deceptions reminiscent of earlier racial and racist shorts. When the original eight reel version of The Green Eyed Monster was released in late 1919, not surprisingly, the reaction to it was mixed. Black audiences responded quite favorably to the story of racial uplift and achievement and to the attractive cast of middle-class characters in the main plot. But the frenetic subplot with its exaggerated caricatures hark back to the racial comedies that many black moviegoers found so offensive. Quite simply, Norman realized the comedy hurt the drama. So he wisely decided to split the film into two, a five real love story and thriller entitled The Green-Eyed Monster and a two real comic farce entitled The Love Book. It was a good decision. The split worked. As Norman assured one theater manager, the new Green-Eyed Monster is now 100% better than it was with the comedy, while the comedy on its own was proving highly successful as well. In his promotional materials for the Green-Eyed Monster, Norman was quick to emphasize that there is not a white man in the cast, a phrase that he repeated often in describing his race productions. Nor is there anything of the usual mimicry of the Negro. That all black casting was no doubt the reason even George Johnson, the co-founder of the Lincoln Motion Picture Company, described Norman's film as one of the biggest drawing cards ever played to Negro houses. And indeed, in large cities as well as in small towns, Green-Eyed Monster broke attendance records, especially when the one-legged actor Steve Reynolds, nicknamed Peg Reynolds, seen here in a still from the Green-Eyed Monster, appeared in person to promote it. Peg, by the way, was Norman's favorite, all-time uh, all -time favorite actor. He appeared in every one of Norman's features. An audience favorite, he could do it all. He rode a bike, played his wooden leg like a ukulele, and even surprised outlaws by shooting a shotgun through it. 
Billed as a sequel to The Green-Eyed Monster, but released separately a few months later in 1920, the reworked The Love Bug included an expanded ending that addressed and that significantly downplayed and even reversed some of the stereotypes in the original version. That ending transformed the hapless Quintus into a newlywed husband and a well-dressed father of three adorable babies played as the advertisements promoted real colored triplets. In other words, he was a good family man, a role that was rarely afforded black characters in white studio productions. By introducing an element of uplift and ambition, Norman gave the familiar story an essential twist that differentiated it from the more generic formulaic comedies of its day. Almost immediately after completing production, Norman started roadshowing the two films. Road showing was exactly what it sounds like, a tedious and convoluted process by which many early race filmmakers took to the road to distribute their pictures. Most white producers, by contrast, had distribution agencies or outlets that performed that function for them. So they could grab a film, take it to the distributor, and start a new picture right away. But race filmmakers did not have that luxury. So, Hand carrying the prints, Norman personally delivered the pictures to his exhibitors, state by state, city by city, town by town, sometimes traveling by car, sometimes by bus or train, occasionally even on foot. On one six-week tour through the South in early 1921, the Green-Eyed Monster grossed almost $4,000, a huge amount for that time. It would go on to become one of the most popular race films of the 1920s, and it continued to be shown well into the 1930s, years after the advent of talking pictures. The Green-Eyed Monster was a spectacular start to Norman's race film career. Encouraged by his success, he soon embarked on a new project, a black cast western to be shot on location in Oklahoma, a territory of great symbolic importance to early race filmmakers because of the opportunities it historically offered and it was a place familiar to Norman from his years as an independent traveling producer. To exploit the popular fascination with the Western, Norman chose to spotlight black cowboys, heirs to the original black and mixed race cowpunchers who helped to settle the frontier, and the Florida Seminoles who had migrated there. Using the so-called all-colored town of Boley as its primary locale, Norman began filming at the Miller Brothers 101 Ranch, home of a, a popular Wild West show that starred legendary black rodeo and trick rider Bill Pickett. Pickett's move involved wrestling a steer to the ground and then immobilizing it with a strong bite to its lip, a stunt that earned him the nickname The Bulldogger. Needless to say, Pickett had a unique talent and a rather unique look because he had almost no teeth left. He was also a notorious drunk, which may be how he got the courage, the uh, liquid courage, we could say, to perform his act. It was that bulldogging, stunting the daring riding and roping trips of other black rodeo champions of the world, whom Norman filmed at various local rodeos and roundups that became the core of the Bulldogger, which was released in 1922. Framing the action was a slim plot involving Pickett as a ranch foreman who outwits the rustlers who have been stealing his cattle. Cast as the female lead in The Bulldogger was distinguished stage performer Anita Bush, the so-called little mother of color drama and founder of the renowned Harlem-based acting troupe The Lafayette Players. Her salary of $125 a week, which Norman liked to point out, made her the highest paid black film performer. That may or may not have been an exaggeration, but either way, it was certainly not far from the truth. The male lead went to Bush's uh, fellow Lafayette player, Lawrence Chenault, a longtime leading man in black silent films whose name alone would ensure a big draw. Chenault indeed played in more silent race films than any other performer. Norman knew that once he had the pair on site, he could likely persuade them to stay an extra week or two to complete a second picture, a strategy that cash strapped race filmmakers employed whenever possible. And that's precisely what Norman did. Using the same actors and locations, he shot a second picture, The Crimson Skull, which had a more conventional plot than The Bulldogger. Billed as a baffling Western mystery photo play with a brilliant cast of colored artists, it told the story of the peace-loving little town of Boley, which is being menaced by the villainous Skull and his hooded band of terrors, who of course evoked images of the Ku Klux Klan. After Lem Nelson, owner of the Crown Sea Ranch, is persuaded to accept the dangerous job of sheriff, his ranch foreman, Bob Calum, volunteers to join the outlaw gang in order to aid in their capture. But the outlaws are initially suspicious of Bob. Accusing him of treason, they force him to undergo the dreaded test of the Crimson Skull, which involved dropping blood through a human skull in order to determine a person's guilt or innocence. 
After being exonerated, Bob baits the outlaws with misinformation about the bank payroll. Following a big shootout, the terrorists are captured and exposed. Bob receives a $5,000 reward, and he weds Lem's daughter, Anita. The late Mrs. Uh, Catherine Hyatt, the daughter of Bruce Norman, told me a great story about the skull test. She said that her father, Bruce, recalled sitting with Richard and with a real human skull at their mother's kitchen table and experimenting with different fluids that would offer just the right viscosity. And the winner was chocolate syrup. To manage his costs, Norman tried to cut corners wherever and whenever he could. He contacted Bowley's sheriff about borrowing equipment locally, advised Bush and Chanel to bring with them any clothing that might prove suitable for their roles, and he even asked his mother for the loan of her Spanish monkey sculpture as a prop. Instead of renting Western costumes, he decided instead to buy chaps, bandanas, and overalls that he could later reuse. And as he bragged to Bruce, he even sewed the outlaw's hoods himself by hand. In November 1921, Norman started showing an early print of the Bulldogger in Oklahoma and in Texas. He promoted the picture with colorful posters and heralds that he had designed himself and that emphasized the action in the films. Did you ever see real colored cowboys? Well, here they are. He also encouraged exhibitors to employ promotional gimmicks, such as the hiring of a costumed actor, to ride around the town as the mysterious outlaw Skull, with a sign that read, come find out who I am at the so-and-so theater tonight. As Norman had hoped, both Westerns opened strong with very favorable response from audiences and even from theaters that, as one booking agent remarked, had just about given up playing colored cast pictures. Norman soon had two concurrent roadshows out on the film, each with a full lobby of guns and chaps. Single-day box office receipts ran into the hundreds of dollars, and even many of the big 1,000-seat theaters reported standing room only at many of the showings. Yet while audiences found Norman's Westerns thrilling, Censors took issue with certain subjects or scenes. Norman's problems were not nearly as consequential as those of his of rival, Oscar Michal, who battled regularly with censors and who actually enjoyed provoking them. But they were challenging nonetheless. The Ohio Department of Education, for instance, insisted on numerous changes to the bulldog, including, ironically, the deletion of virtue old Pickett's signature bulldogging scenes. The Pennsylvania State Board of Censors was even stricter. It disapproved the Crimson Skull entirely, because of the black criminals engaged in violence and defiance of authorities throughout. Yet it's important for us to remember that films like The Birth of a Nation in 1915, which depicted graphic violence per perpetrated by whites against blacks, faced little or no official censure. To get the necessary approvals to exhibit the Westerns, Norma was forced to make a number of cuts, though he turned that experience into a positive one by learning how to assemble prints of his later films in such a way that portions deemed offensive by censors could be deleted without ruining the story. An even greater and more pressing concern than censorship was distribution. Working as an independent producer, Norman lacked Hollywood's infrastructure and opportunities. Thus, his long-distance distribution involved considerable pre-planning in order to get the dates that he wanted, and in order to create efficient routes. Ideally, he tried to establish a complete circuit of towns and cities that began and ended in Florida. Early on, Bruce Norman served not only as a cameraman for the company, but also as a roadman after the picture was completed. The two brothers worked closely and collaboratively, developing a kind of literal and figurative shorthand in their various business dealings. But Richard also traveled widely on his own, delivering prints and meeting personally with theater owners to arrange future bookings. A meticulous record keeper, he maintained extensive paperwork, most of which was preserved by his son and donated to Indiana University where it's archived and where some of it has already been digitized. Those records detail the seating capacity of every theater he visited, the names of the competing theaters, the quality of the projectors and other equipment in the house, which was a vital consideration since poor machinery could ruin the print and therefore add substantially to Norman's costs the admissions prices at theater charge for matinee and evening screenings, the availability of a local band, even the race, religion, and ethnicity of the owner or manager, and sometimes even the names of their children. In letters to his brother, Norman often bemoaned the frustrations he faced on the road. Once, for example, he blew out a tire in downtown Chicago and couldn't replace it. Another time, he ripped his only pair of good pants, and it took two days to get them repaired. The biggest frustrations, though, were with the frequent and unexpected closings of race theaters and the refusal of exhibitors to pay fair prices. He had no choice, he wrote to Bruce, but to try to get the best price possible, however low it might be, or else, in his words, sit on the curb and watch the parade go by. 
After Bruce left the film business in early 1923 to pursue his own ventures, Norman had to rely on the services of other roadmen. Some like M.C. Maxwell, a skilled magician who had spent many years performing on the vaudeville circuits and who later acted in one of Norman's films, proved to be highly reliable. Others were less dependable, and at least one was blatantly dishonest, failing to turn over money that Norman was due, and even collecting a large fee from a distributor for a film that he did not actually represent, and then skipping town. The road shows, however, confirmed Norman's belief that Black moviegoers were hungry for good, first-run Black cast films. So for his next project, he chose an original 15-part serial titled The Fighting Fool, which he soon, named, soon renamed Zircon that teemed with big fights, thrilling situations, suspense, mystery, adventure, and love. A radical departure from early white produced cinematic series such as the Rastus and Sambo shorts, which featured black characters in low comic stereotypical roles. Norman planned to showcase ambitious black characters such as the hero, John Manning, who discovers the formula for a new wonder substance called Zircon. Manning is doggedly pursued by a villain named Spider who conspires to steal the formula. But despite facing mortal danger in a desert a sandstorm, an ancient tomb, a, a nest of crocodiles, a snake pit, and so on, Manning and his sweetheart Helen defeat the villain and reap millions from Zirka. Having self financed his earlier pictures, Norman recognized that a multi-part serial, notably the first ever black cast serial, would be significantly more expensive to produce than a single feature film. The budget that he projected was around $10,700, and to meet those costs, Norman settled on a novel method of capitalizing his project. Theater owners could buy into the serial through a profit-sharing rental franchise. The actual franchise terms and contract prices, which varied from city to city and even from theater to theater, were based on a somewhat idiosyncratic rating system that Norman devised. Noted actor Clarence Brooks was signed and ready to assume the lead role. Everything seemed to be moving well. But by midsummer, Norman curiously and abruptly shifted his focus from Zircon, which continued to be advertised for years as in progress that was never completed or released. Instead, he turned to a new feature film, the South Seas Adventure Regeneration. Sea pictures, he claimed, are all the rage now. Regeneration was set on a desert island where the heroine Violet Daniels and her companion Captain Jack Roper had been stranded by Knife Hurley, the villain who stole the treasure map that was bequeathed to her by her father. Years later, Knife returns to the island, which of course turns out to be the very spot pictured on the map. The lovers defeat him, discover the buried treasure, and are rescued. Since Regeneration was more overtly sexual than his previous films, Norman tried to cast an especially attractive lead actress who could, in his words, draw audiences like a mustard poultice. The role eventually went to the light-skinned beauty Stella Mayo, who co-starred along M.C. Maxwell, Norman's former roadman. And Peg Reynolds appeared as well as the ship's cook who helps Violet retrieve the treasure chart. Norman's advance advertising hyped the film, as did the exploitation accessories, which included racy window cards of Stella Mayo, billed as a sensational colored screen beauty, bathing naked, though tastefully only in silhouette, as you can see in the poster. Norman urged exhibitors to pub publicize the film in equally attention-grabbing ways. For example, by dressing their theater's lobbies with, with palms and moss and white sands, provocative signs reading, two souls left to perish by a cutthroat crew, what was their regeneration? Officially released on Christmas Day, 1923, the film proved to be a blockbuster. At its premiere showing at the Jacksonville Theater, it broke the box office record of eight years and continued to break records elsewhere with long runs and big ticket sales. It was equally successful on the road. In Birmingham, for example, at a 470-seat theater, it played night and day to accommodate 6,000 patrons. In Knoxville, 1,800 people turned out for a single showing. In New Orleans, Regeneration blockaded four blocks of the city. Even by summer, theaters were still turning away one to 200 people at each performance, and Norma was earning by that point as much as $1,200 a day. While Regeneration was still in progress, Norman began negotiations to purchase the former Eagle Studios in Jacksonville, a film plant where he could produce, develop, and edit his own pictures. With the new studio came new projects, including a possible collaboration with Captain Edison C. McVeigh, the self-described king of stunts, a skilled black flyer and one of the world's great aeronautic daredevils. McVeigh had formed the Afro-American Film Producers, a small Texas-based film company. 
Norman, however, convinced him to postpone his own film and to star in Norman's upcoming picture, an aviation adventure to be shot in Jacksonville. McVeigh agreed, but the arrangement soon fell apart. Determined to find a new opportunity, Norman approached Bessie Coleman, who billed herself as the only colored girl aviator in the world. Norman and Coleman began planning a picture about her life. Sadly, though, that picture never materialized. In April 1926, Coleman was killed while practicing for an air show to benefit the Negro Welfare League in Norman's hometown of Jacksonville. Still determined, and more determined than ever, to produce an aviation film, Norman scripted his own version, The Flying Ace, alternatively titled The Black Ace. After contacting and considering many of the top actors of the day, he signed the iconic team of Lawrence Kreiner and Catherine Boyd, veterans of the Lafayette Players, one of the best and most distinguished acting companies in New York. A smashing airplane detective mystery done in a smashing way, The Flying Ace was advertised as a novel, colored picture, timely too, coming right on the heels of the death of Bessie Coleman with stunts in it and thrills that she never attempted or could do. In the picture, which by the way was filmed entirely on the ground at the Norman Studios in Jacksonville, Captain Billy Stokes, a hero of World War I and a flying ace, returns from service overseas to solve the most baffling case of his career, the disappearance of the $25,000 payroll of the Eastern Division. With the help of his sidekick and mechanic, Peg, Stokes exonerates the aged station master who is suspected of the theft, rescues the station master's daughter, Ruth, from a fellow aviator who takes her hostage in his plane when she rebuffs his advances and exposes the real criminals. In his promotions, Norman offered details about the making of the film, particularly about the model Curtis JN4D, the type of plane that Coleman was flying when she was killed. The symbol of Captain Stokes' heroism, his past triumphs, and his ability to use the new technology to good purpose, that prop plane, proudly built by Norman himself, was in some ways the real star of the film. Captain Richard E. Norman, who grew up on the studio lot and who eventually became a commercial pilot, recalled some of the tricks that his father employed in filming his stunning aerial shots, including a rudimentary but very effective one, simply flipping the camera upside down for several flight scenes. Even more than his early films, Norman's The Flying Ace broke records and demand for it continued for decades. But perhaps the greatest testament to the novelty of The Flying A's was not its box office op, uh, numbers or its longevity, but rather its success in showing Blacks in roles that they should have had, but in reality were denied. We need to remember the U.S. Armed Forces would not allow Black aviators until the 1940s, and in fact, they radically restricted Black service in other branches of the military. Clearly, therefore, the flying ace required the audience's suspension of disbelief to buy the American screen dream of, of rising literally and figuratively to the pinnacle. Yet that notion of racial uplift, the promise of advancement through individual achievement, was central to the film and consistent with contemporary Black ideology. Like his fellow race producers, Norman was determined to give his audiences the role models that they craved but never saw in studio productions. For his next picture, Norman decided to return to the Oklahoma Territory, this time to Tatum's, another old black town where he planned to, to film a series of true stories of living colored examples showing their dramatic rise to leadership and wealth against overwhelming odds. Such a series, he believed, would inspire ambition in members of the race to accomplish things achieved by their leaders. The first film in that series, Black Gold, was based on the real life story of Black leaseholder around Tatum's, who uh, years earlier had brought in three producing wells on his property. A thrilling ep epic of the oil fields where, upon discovery of oil, the locals succumbed to black gold fever. The film told a story of greed, adventure, and, of course, romance. Once again, Norman cast veteran Lawrence Kreiner and Catherine Boyd as his leads, and Peg Reynolds played the hero's trusty sidekick, all of which ensured that black gold, in Norman's words, would hang up records wherever it played. So Norman began planning a second film, another of his true stories of living colored examples, with the same cast in Tatum's. But in fact, there would be no more Norman features. With the landscape of the industry quickly changing, Norman found himself in competition not simply with other producers of black silent films, but also with the Hollywood studios and the new technology of sound film, which was already revolutionizing the industry. And with the advent of the Great Depression, black theaters always Norman's primary and largest clientele, were closing, making distribution even more problematic than ever. Norman, though, was not one to give up. 
Lacking the resources and technology to produce true talking pictures, he decided to approach filmmaking from another angle by developing and marketing a non-synchronous sound system that he called camera phone. But with its numerous flaws, it was soon surpassed by other systems, paramount among them the variable density sound on film system developed by Western Electric, which rendered camera phones mechanical apparatus obsolete. Norman was forced to declare bankruptcy and he was never able to return to feature film production again. Over the next decade, Norman struggled to remain relevant in the industry. He negotiated contracts with the army to provide black cast pictures for screening in the Black Theater at Fort Benning, Georgia. And he sold prints of his films to exhibitors in countries such as Liberia, which wanted to introduce Negro artists into their shows. He also tried to muster business closer to home by leasing his Jacksonville studio and equipment to other producers or potential filmmakers. Most importantly, he started road showing his films once again. This time, though, the road shows were significantly less successful and certainly far less profitable. Instead of theatrical exhibitions, Norman was forced to consider other outlets for distribution. Schools and churches, long a prime site of Black film spectatorship, became his new venue. Typically, he would contact local church or civic leaders and or the principals of Black schools, and he would offer them a variety of entertainment packages, which usually included one of his own films and a few staple shorts by other producers. Then he would embark on the road tours, often carrying with him his own projector. Terms were fairly standard, a split of anywhere between 25 and 50 percent between Norman and the church or the school. The roadshow routes, which took Norman through Florida and into the neighboring states, were tedious and sometimes utterly unrewarding work. On a good night, he netted $30 on a poor night as little as $4. Most nights, the net was somewhere in between, still a modest return for a filmmaker whose pictures had grossed hundreds of dollars per night only a few years earlier. By the mid-1930s, Norman found a more lucrative opportunity, distributing films featuring black fighter and knockout puncher Joe Lewis. Known as the Brown Bomber for his exceptional strength in the ring, Lewis was a hero to Black Americans and a role model for Black youth. Since Black audiences were eager to witness Lewis's triumphs over white opponents, but because many white theaters refused to run the fights for that reason, Norman began road showing them at Black theaters and in Black schools, churches, and auditoriums. Throughout the 1930s and into the early 1940s, Norman also maintained his studio in Jacksonville, where he would return to shoot industrial films, advertising shorts for local businesses, and promotional pieces. His wife, Gloria, used the studio facilities, too, to operate a dance studio that became a Jacksonville institution. By the late 1940s, after he had stopped road showing pictures, he purchased uh, two motion picture houses, including the famous Theater for Colored in Winter Park, Florida, which he and Gloria managed. Norman operated theaters for at least a decade, well into the 1950s. When he died in Jacksonville in November 1960, his death brought to a close a remarkable career. Today, Norman's work as a pioneering independent race producer is finally being recognized. That work sheds new light on regional filmmaking, especially in Florida, which was once considered the first Hollywood. Even more importantly, the study of his filmmaking in the absence of most of the films themselves offers scholars and historians a vital way to investigate a singular era in American cinema history. Now hailed as a pivotal figure in the early race film industry, Norman also played a role in social history, especially in the nascent civil rights movement. By reversing the old familiar stereotypes, celebrating black achievement and creating new visual imagery that promoted black achievement and ambition. Progressive in his thinking, he disdained racial portraits that were negative and elevated his female characters like Ruth Sautel in The Flying A's, Norma's only extant film, making them integral to his plots and not mere adjuncts to the action. By challenging dominant films, racial politics, and on-screen racist portrayals, he helped to change the landscape of American cinema. It has been more than a century since Norman produced his first landmark race films. Thanks to the Norman Studio Silent Film Museum in Jacksonville and to the tireless work of its supporters like Rita Reagan, Barbara Wingo, uh, Devin Leslie, and, and, and Jim Kirkhoff, Norman's achievement will continue to be admired and celebrated a century from now, and deservedly so. Thank you for your attention and your interest in Richard E. Norman and the Norman Studios. Thank you, Barbara. As a special treat, we're about to see one of Richard Norman's earliest works, which was the itinerant film Barbara Tepelupak mentioned in her presentation. It's the 1915 comedy titled Sleepy Sam the Sleuth. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. 
Barbara for a very, very informative and comprehensive discussion of Richard Norman and of race filmmaking. We appreciate all of your work in this area, particularly as it relates to Richard Norman. As I said at the beginning of this presentation, I want to introduce you to the Norman Studios Complex in Jacksonville, Florida. As I mentioned before, this complex consists of five buildings and represents a complete silent films studio. Originally, it was the Eagle Film Manufacturing Company studio. Eagle Film Manufacturing came from Chicago in late 1915 with the idea that they would set up a film studio in Jacksonville, which was then considered to be the winter film capital of the world. And their idea was we would have everything in this complex to provide services for other film companies, as well as to make films ourselves. So they took over a building that had been built as a cigar factory, probably never used as a cigar factory, built in 1914. And in 1916, they built the other four buildings of this complex, which are a generator building, a wardrobe cottage, a props garage, and the set building, which is actually directly behind me. The amazing thing about this complex, obviously, is it has now existed for over 100 years and still is here in Jacksonville and so represents a tremendous opportunity for us as the Norman Studio Silent Film Museum Group, which has a contract with the city of Jacksonville to run this property to educate in the areas of race films, Richard Norman's history, as well as silent films in general. And to this end, very generously, the city of Jacksonville has completed the renovations of the first floor of the projection building, which you see very much in the back of me. And now that is museum space, which we are now opening to the public this summer for the first time. And so it will begin the process, which will be completed when the second floor is actually made into a museum as well, of making this a museum in those three areas that represent the importance of the National Historic Landmark that Norman Studios is. As I said at first, it represents the Eagle Films Studio Complex, which is the only complex that exists from that era that Jacksonville was called the winter film capital of the world. And I'm sure you've all seen the other presentations and know what I'm talking about there. But maybe even more important than, and I think actually more important is the fact that Richard Norman purchased this property to continue making the race films he had started to make in 1919, to continue to make those race films through the silent film era. So it represents the only extant race films studio in the country. That's its significance. And that's the significance we are determined to show in our museum and in the property complex. So I thank you very much for listening to this presentation and hope you will visit us in Jacksonville very soon. That's it for this edition of Early Filmmaking in Jacksonville, Florida. We'd like to thank Barbara Tepelupek for her excellent presentation about Richard Norman's challenges and accomplishments as a filmmaker. If after watching our program, you'd like to find out more about this innovative producer, Barbara's book, Richard E. Norman and Race Filmmaking is an excellent resource. Oh, just one more thing. If you'd like more information about the Niles SNA or Norman Studios Silent Film Museums, all you have to do is go to the website shown here. 
Your support and help would be very much appreciated. Thanks for being with us. We're looking forward to presenting more programs just like this one that highlight Jacksonville's motion picture heritage. Take care.